Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's gospel presents us with the first miracle performed by our Lord, uh, the changing of water into wine at the Feast of Cana. In this episode, which comes to us from the second chapter of the Gospel of St. John, actually reminds us of another event which the Apostle writes about in his last book, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, when St. John in Revelation 19 tells us about another wedding feast. The wedding feast at Cana in John chapter 2, as we know, takes place on earth. The wedding feast in Revelation 19 actually takes place in heaven with a great multitude crying out before the Lord, saying, Let us rejoice and exalt and give God the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has been made, has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. So in a certain sense, uh, the New Testament writings of the Apostle St. John are framed by these two wedding feasts, one in his gospel at the beginning, the other one at the end of his book of Revelation. We also said that today's episode in the gospel is actually the first recorded miracle of Jesus. St. John, for his part, when he speaks of our Lord's miracles, doesn't actually call them miracles. He calls them signs. In Greek, it's semeon. Uh, there are seven miracles, seven signs in the gospel of St. John. The other three gospels speak of a lot of a lot more miracles that Jesus performed uh, during his public ministry. But St. John presents us only with seven, and he calls them signs because they point to the divinity of Christ and to the fact that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. You know, a sign, we can say, is something that points beyond itself to something else. It's like the signs that we see on the highway, for example. You know, if I'm driving in my hometown on Route 140 and I see a sign for Boston. That's a sign pointing me in the direction that I want to go. The sign itself is not the end of my journey. Uh, and in and of itself, it's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking to go to Boston, and that sign's actually telling me how to get there. It's pointing me in the right direction. In a similar way, the miracles of Jesus weren't actually ends in themselves, but they were signs pointing to, again, pointing to his divinity and to the fact that he is the Savior. And St. John, as we said, gives us seven signs or seven miracles in his gospel. That number seven is a number of perfection. It means completeness or wholeness. And in the episode that we heard today, uh, we see that number seven is actually contrasted with the number six. Six, which signifies the water jars, which were at the wedding feast. That biblical number of six is a sign of imperfection. Just as the water jars were used, uh, and the water jars that were, which we're speaking of were actually used for purification rituals for the Jews before they ate. And so they were actually tied to the ceremonial washing, uh, tied to the observance of the Mosaic law. In verse 3 of the gospel, we heard Our Lady say, they have no wine. And then at the end of the, the gospel, we heard the chief steward, who here was called the head waiter, we heard him say to the bridegroom, you have saved the best wine for last, in, chapter 10, in verse 10. The fathers of the church commenting on this tell us that this was a sign of the incompletion and the imperfection of the Mosaic law on the one hand, at the beginning, and the superabundance of grace which came to us through Jesus Christ on the other hand. Uh, to paraphrase the apostle St. Paul, you know, you can't get to heaven observing the 613 uh, prescriptions of the Mosaic Law. If you could, Christ would be unnecessary. St. John, in the prologue of his gospel, tells us this. He says, For the law came, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 1, verse 17. The Mosaic Law in and of itself was good, uh, but it doesn't save anyone. Only Christ saves uh, and of course, in another element, there is a strong Eucharistic aspect to this marriage feast in Cana as well. Of the seven signs which St. John reveals in his gospel or speaks of, 
The first one, the one we heard today, the transformation of the water into wine, is actually connected with the fourth sign, which is the multiplication of the loaves in chapter 6 of his gospel. And both of those signs are connected with the last sign, the seventh sign, which is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, recorded in John chapter 20. Or we can even explain it in reverse order. You know, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, there is a heavenly banquet in which there's bread and wine offered for the wedding feast for the wedding guests to feast on. That heavenly banquet is actually still found here on earth in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where the risen Christ gives his body and his blood. He gives it to us so that we may be purified, that we may be fortified, that we may be spiritually prepared for that eternal wedding banquet, which is in heaven, which the Apostle speaks of in Revelation 19. And the last thing we'll just mention today is we can't talk about this gospel without mentioning Our Lady, without talking about the Marian aspect of this wedding feast. You know, Jesus' response to his mother, which we heard today, the New American Bible, the revised edition, translated, translates it this way. Woman, how does your concern affect me? Uh, it actually, it's actually Hebrew idiom. Literally translated, it means, what is this or what is that to me and to you? Jesus first calls uh, his mother a woman. He doesn't call her mother. And he does so because he's actually alluding to her role in the new creation in the plan of God's salvation. We know that Mary is the perfect woman alongside the perfect man who is Jesus Christ. She is the new Eve alongside the new Adam. Genesis 2 verse 18 we remember from that, uh, then it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Mary is Jesus' helper, and she's Jesus' partner. As Eve was meant to be the helper and partner alongside Adam. You know, when Jesus says to Mary, What is that to me and to you? It implies that they have a common interest in this affair. And not only in this affair of the marriage banquet at Cana, but more importantly, in the affair of bringing God's salvation to the world. And then Jesus, still speaking to his mother, adds, My hour has not yet come. John 2, verse 4. What is that hour? We know that Jesus uh, speaks of that hour here, but also uh, in his gospel as well. In this gospel as well, and the hour principally refers to his glorification on the cross, his crucifixion. It's that same hour on Calvary where the new Adam from the tree of the cross actually turns to the new Eve and again addressing her as woman. He says, woman, behold your son, John 19, 26, uh, referring to St. John the, the Apostle. And if you can read between the lines, our Lord does seem to say that it's at that hour, at the hour of his glorification, when the woman, when Mary, will be able to ask of him whatever she wants, and it will be granted to her. The first thing that's granted to her under the cross is spiritual motherhood. She does become the mother of the beloved disciple of St. John, and consequently she becomes the mother of everyone who is a disciple of Christ. Why? Precisely because she is the new Eve. She is the new mother of all the living and that title, New Eve, yes, it isn't in the Gospel, it's not in the New Testament. The title for New Adam, uh, for Christ, is in the, Gospel, is in the New Testament, St. Paul's writings. But that title, New Eve, actually comes to us from St. Irenaeus, who was the Bishop of Lyon, who died in around the year 200 A.D. Uh, St. Irenaeus was born in Asia Minor, around the year 140 or 160 A.D. Asia Minor is where St. John lived the last years of his life. And as a young man, Irenaeus had listened to the sermons of St. Polycarp of Smyrna. St. Polycarp himself was a disciple of St. John the Apostle. So that title, New Eve, has a direct connection even with the Apostle in that sense. So Jesus, at the prompting of his mother, began his public ministry 
by changing water into wine at Cana in Galilee. And we understand this also to be a sign of how Our Lady is the mediatrix of all graces, how every grace that we receive from God comes to us through her, through her maternal hands, just as the grace of the miracle of Cana came about because of her intercession, and just as the grace and the miracle of having Jesus Christ himself come to us on earth came about through Mary, through her perfect cooperation with God's plan of salvation. And so now in the Mass, we move from the liturgy of the Word to the liturgy of the Eucharist, that liturgical hour which, in which Jesus represents himself for us on the altar so that we can, be, we can be nourished by his body and blood and so that we can be prepared for that heavenly banquet which we will experience one day in heaven, God willing. Praise be Jesus and Mary.